Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. This episode of the House of Mystery is brought to you by Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. LegacyFoodStorage.com New U.S. sanctions on Iran took effect in six months after President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the international nuclear deal. The sanctions targeted Iran's shipping, financial, and energy sectors all key to the country's already struggling economy. The bombs, which the FBI referred to as improvised explosive devices, were sent to the FBI's bomb laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. We're in Mexico again tonight as thousands of migrants try to find a faster way to the U.S. border. The White House says it's now getting help from the Mexican Breaking news out of Pittsburgh. The man accused in the shooting at the uh, synagogue in Pittsburgh is pleading not guilty, and he also wants a jury trial because he's facing a 44 count. So, in the final seconds before the Boeing 737 Max crashed into the water, it was traveling at more than 500 kilometers an hour. All 189 people on board were killed. You've now entered the House of Mystery. Crime, conspiracy, history, and science. With your hosts, Al Warren, Mike Brown, Julie Saab, Michael Butterfield, Dr. Joseph Yusinski, and Michael Hawley. Heard on KCAA 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. Uh, next up on the uh, stage today, as we call it, uh, we've got an author, and um, she has her own press company, too. So um, let's welcome W. L. Hawken to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Al. I'm really happy to be here. Wow. So you you got quite a, a resume here. I just uh, love reading about you. Um, the first thing I notice is, um, so you mentioned that you like to travel or love to travel to the locations in your books. Um, so I have to ask, is, is the location or the scene that you're writing about, do you write that as a character in its own? Yes, actually, the location and the landscape becomes a really integral part of the, of the book and the scene because of the energy and part of why I like to go is to actually experience the energy of what's happening in that landscape. So if someone was to say, well, what do you mean by that? Like what um, the energy? So let's talk about that. So you're looking for the feel of the land, the feel of the land. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm an INFP, I don't know if, if we look into Myers-Briggs, but, but I'm a feeling, perceiving personality. So for me, I don't think as much as I feel things into being. So if I go to a location, for example, in the last book I wrote, I had to climb to the top of a hill. 
in the middle of a cow pasture in Ireland because that's where my character was inaugurated as a king and then ritually murdered. And I wanted to stand on the top of the hill and look out into the surrounding countryside and see everything he would have seen. So that gives me a better feel for how I'm going to incorporate that into the writing. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, that's, I, I'm guessing this is book four of your Holy Stone mystery, and that's To Kill a King. That's the one we're talking about? That, that's the one I just mentioned, yes. Mm -hmm. So... So when you do this, it looks like your, your, your characters are also a very big part of this. Um, where, where does all that come from for you? My muses? Yeah, like, so, so when you're going to sit down and write um, this book, To Kill a King, this is book four, um, mm -hmm. how, how, where do you draw from to get the characters and the scene and 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 you're going to Ireland and you're going to the top of the hill and stuff like that. Where does this, where does this all come from? Well, that one was pretty particular in that it's a bit of a spin-off from book two. So in book two, at the end of it, there is an, ar ar an archaeologist. They're in Scotland and there's an Irish archaeologist working in Scotland. And at the end of book two, she meets up with Kernunos, the ancient horned god, and spends some time with him over Beltane. And in return, he offers to take her anywhere in the world, in any culture that she would like to go to. And because she's an archaeologist, she has, of course, been lots of places, and um, she doesn't know. And I didn't know for a while either. But I do know her backstory is that when she was 14, she had gone to the museum, uh, the Irish Museum in Dublin, and she had seen a bog body, Old Crogan Man, who was pulled out of the bog in 2003. And she, Sorsha has uh, an ability, she has psychometry. So when she touched the metal plates on his leather armband, he's still wearing, he's 2,000 years old, but he, in our time, is actually still wearing this armband. And when she touches those, she actually has a vision of his face. And in that moment, she kind of falls in love with him, but she also decides she has to be an archaeologist, and she wants to tell the stories of the ancestors. So that was going on in my mind. I wasn't sure where she was going to go. And, and then one night I was looking through National Geographic, and I saw the mummified fist of old Krogan man and the torso and that just really caught me. I wanted to tell his story and I wanted to give his life and death meaning and so I put those two things together and they turned into book four. Wow. So That's a long answer, stuff. I know. <laughs> well, no, I, it's, uh, you know, that we, we're hoping to get more, you know, detailed stuff like that. That's important. I'm just going to say you've got a lot of stuff going on in your mind. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I, it, it, so this must really take you away from regular life, so to speak. That's the best part of it, really. I mean, it, it is. And when I'm, when I'm writing and when I'm actually in that creative mode, because you know there are so many different modes to, from when you start creating to when you actually get into revising and formatting and all that stuff. But when I'm in that creative mode, I'm in it. So I might be, I might be just working like eight hours a day when I'm working at that, when I'm drafting and out walking. I do a lot of walking out in the woods with my dog, and that's where I really put it all together and I see it and, um, and I write what I see. Wow. So in, in essence, you're saying you really don't know where you're going to go with it. It just sort of takes you there. Yeah. I hate, yes, I hate those terms, um, plotter and pantser, but um, so I call myself an intuitive writer. Okay. So yeah. it's kind of a, it's, it's, again, it's more of a feeling, right? So the feeling draws mm -hmm. you to where you're going to go. Um, do, you, do, do you think that you pick up influences? Like, so when you're, when you're writing your characters and when you're going through the development, um, 
do people in in your life or people you run across or meet do they sort of get um, drawn into it as well like you take from people around you no I don't think so and everybody's breathing a sigh of relief <laughs> no <laughs> yeah I'm sure yeah especially the ones that have those real bad deaths right you know, <laughs> I will say, I will say, on a, I think an occasion in antagonist that there may be some qualities of people I have met over the years that are antagonistic, and that might come out. But um, in terms of just creating characters, they come to me often fully formed, and they're not people I I know, although they're people I'd really like to know, and they become friends. So they're actually part of my life, but they're not real. So, so what do you consider your, your, your characters then? I mean, and I ask that because a lot of the uh, fiction writers are people that um, we interview. And, and, of course, I'm always doing nonfiction and, and um, stories that are just as they happen. I don't get to create characters. What do you feel about your characters? Are they like kids to you? Or are they family? Are they, wh- wh- how would you classify them? Oh, they're definitely not kids. They're um, they're friends. I, I actually call them my muses, and uh, especially the the main protagonist, who's who's been with me through the whole thing. His name's Estrada, and he has become a part of my life. And he really directs everything that's going on in the story. we and I didn't really know this because, as I was saying, I don't. I don't sit down and plot out like, oh, I'm going to write this many books, and in this book this happens, and then this happens. I just started with one book a few years ago, and at the end of it there was a cliffhanger, and then I had to keep going. And when I got to the end of To Kill a King, which is the fourth book, I realized that there's this huge character arc that goes from the beginning of the first book to the end of the last book that really tells Estrada's story his inner story of his relationships and his challenges. So you, so and you his really friends, have to, and his friends. Yeah. I was going to say, you have to be really involved as well because you're, you're taking this character, you're taking a strata from book one to book four. And, um, it, so you're really developing this character. I kind of feel like Estrada is developing this character and taking it. I, I, a lot of the time, I feel like I'm just listening to what he's doing and telling me. And um, I, I see I see things a lot. Like my my writing process is is like I'll I often ask what happens next, and so I will I will be going to bed that night and I'll say, okay, what happens next, and then. I just leave it, and I wake up in the morning, and I often have the whole scene of what happens next. So it's what almost it's, like it's given to me in a way. Right, but what if it's some something that you don't want to do? <laughs> what if it's something you don't like? So you get you kind of you go to bed, and then you get up, and you have the story. And what if it's a place that you don't necessarily want to want to go to? Well, I'm not under their full influence, but no, that no, actually but... <laughs> hasn't happened. That actually oh. hasn't happened. I have, I have had situations where I'm sitting com- writing at my computer and, and I'm writing the draft and a character actually will do something that I don't expect, like something big, like I had a character kill themselves. And I was like, what? And so I, was kind of, I cried through the whole thing. And I left it in because that happened. And, and also sometimes I don't know how the climax is going to happen. And then I'm like, oh, really? That's how it happened. I'm often surprised. It's interesting. I think that emotion, that kind of raw emotion that I'm feeling when I'm experiencing it and I'm putting it into words translates into the, an experience for the reader. So what are the Holly Stone mysteries? What are they? Well, they are a series of books the following Holly Stone Coven, and that's a Wicca coven, 
out of Vancouver. And generally what happens is, well, it started out being um, murder mysteries. So in the first book there is a murder. There's a serial killer. And they're try he's killing witches. And the coven casts a charm to catch the killer before he'll do any more harm. But as anybody who's into Wicca or anything like that will know, when you, spell, when you send out charms or spells, there's always repercussions, and it's a very dangerous thing to do. And so when they send out this spell into the ethers, a whole lot of stuff goes into play. And they catch, uh, they catch up a teenage girl in there who's quite innocent at the beginning of the book, and she gets enmeshed in the spell, and then the people within the coven actually start acting kind of strangely. So in that one, they're, they're trying to catch this killer. And then at the end of that one, um, it became another murder mystery with another person in the coven who goes to Scotland. He's working on an archaeological dig, and he gets charged with murder. Wrong place, wrong time. And is put in prison, a, a quite um, Greenock prison, which is a pretty heavy-duty prison in, in Scotland. And um, he calls Estrada to come and find out who the real killer is and get him out. So that's another murder mystery. And in the same book as that one, Estrada's lover, Michael, back in Vancouver, um, gets himself into trouble with a vampire. So <laughs> my, Michael, <laughs> Michael Strike is a really interesting character, and, and he's been, he also plays through this whole, whole series. He, um, he thinks he's the reincarnation of Lord Byron, and he is quite eccentric, and he plays, he's, he's a manager of a goth club in Vancouver, and he also plays at being a vampire, so he walks around his goth club with fangs and red contacts and, and wearing this long flowing cape. and Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's kind of how he rolls. Anyway, he ends up meeting a real vampire, and that spins into book three. So, so what happens is the story just con continues as we move through. Now, do you feel, uh, like with Wicca, that you need to uh, show Wicca in an accurate and, like, let's say, a realistic manner? Or do you take artistic license when uh, creating your novels? Um, both. I, uh, I do... Okay, I'm not part of a Wicca group, but I've done a lot of solitary Wicca things and studied Druidry as well. And so when I'm writing it, they do a lot of rituals in the woods, and I write all the rituals. I try to make them as accurate as possible. And, yeah, so did I answer that? Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is urban fantasy? Like, how, how would you explain that to someone that, that doesn't know what that is? Right. Well, urban fantasy to me is just a contemporary setting, basically, or modern, a modern setting. Often it's in a city. I don't think it has to be, but um, a contemporary setting, but where the characters connect with supernatural kind of entities. So you're, you're either going to have witches or vampires or ghosts or something paranormal in there. Yeah. And so have you had a lot of paranormal experiences yourself? Is this sort of where it comes from for you? I've had paranormal experiences for sure, yes. I've, I, I've seen ghosts, and as I said, I, I have a lot of conversations. I hear conversations, and I spent about, last year I spent pretty much the whole year um, studying mediumship and psychic development, and that was really interesting. In fact, I met my cover designer for the Tattoo Editions, which are this, this new group of books, at the mediumship uh, work. <laughs> so that's kind of neat. 
and we did a lot of really interesting things. So I went in, I went into mediumship because I was writing a different book, not part of this series, about a girl who sees ghosts, and I wanted to know more about it. And then when I started going to the classes, we, we didn't just talk about it right from day one. It was, okay, you're having a meditation, and you're going to read this other person and see what spirits you pick up. And it was like right into the fire. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I was really quite shocked at how many experiences I had. I guess you could say I'm a medium in that way. Hmm. Do, do you think, sort of think everyone's that way? And I mean a sense that we uh, live in a you know, hard and fast world and we sort of um, aren't in touch with that part of ourselves? Absolutely. I think everybody has... I think everybody has the ability to do these things, and we, what you have to do is kind of, you have to lower your vibration, or sorry, raise your vibration, and then the spirits lower their vibration, and you kind of meet in the middle, and that's, and that's how it works, that you're able to do that. And so the way you raise your vibration is through meditation. So I've done a lot of meditation work, and that helps me. And also when I'm writing, I do that. So if I go, when I'm in my dream, uh, my dream time, like when I'm asking what happens in the story, subconsciously I'm getting the story from wherever it's coming from. I don't know where these places are. And, and when I'm meditating, I often will see the whole story as well. It's a great technique. Well, yeah, it sounds like it. It's, very, it's, it's completely different than what I go through. Um, but I find it interesting. Um, so explain, what, what kind of research do you have to do? Um, how involved is it in, in something like this? Okay. Can you be more specific, like uh, uh, what kind of research for? Well, uh, well, for me, like in, in a true crime book or in a setting, you know, I, I um, so when I'm covering a case, I, I you know, I go meet, um, surviving family members. I go meet the killer side. I go mm. meet the killer himself. I go uh, court records, police, doctors, documents, um, prisons. Mm. You know, there's there's a lot of things that go in, that are involved when I'm putting together a, a book on a case or s some story that happened in 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 our time. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so so I kind of can plot my how I'm going to put together my book and kind of make the times and set up the appointments and figure it all out. Um, mm -hmm. So what what kind of process or do you know what I'm saying? I think um, so here you are, you're getting the story coming to you. Is it just a, a matter of writing it out or do when you get into a subject, like when we're talking uh, Wicca or we're talking about um, goth clubs and stuff like that. Like, there's a lot of parts to your book. You're, you, you've got mm -hmm. time travel, um, obviously mm -hmm. LGBT, right? So there's so many sections of this. But you couldn't have possibly lived all these your, yourself. So I'm saying, do you take time to go learn that or research that part of what you're writing, Bill? Yeah, for sure. For sure, I do. And, I mean, creating the goth club was, was just really something out of my imagination, Although I did research all kinds of cool things you could do at a golf club. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought maybe you'd be going hanging out at them or stuff like yeah. that, right? No, no, no. <laughs> or, but, or, the, the, or the drinks. I thought that would be really fun. And the names of the, the, names of the, uh, the drinks and, and that kind of a thing. Um, but with, well, for example, with uh, the last book, To Kill a King, which is probably the closest to the kind of thing that you're talking about where I actually used real research. Um, I, there's a, after I saw the National Geographic, I started reading the rest of the research on Old Crogan Man, who is an actual bog body that's in the National Museum in, in Ireland. And one of the people, he's kind of an eminent archaeologist, Dr. Eamon Kelly, that's in Ireland, and he put together the Kingship and Sacrifice exhibit at the museum. It's beautiful if you ever get a chance to go to Ireland. And by the way, museums are free in Ireland, so that's kind of a cool thing as well. Mm, when I was yeah. in Dublin for a week, I spent 
pretty much every day hanging out at the museum with the bog body. <laughs> so <laughs> that would be some of that kind of, it's not going to a prison, but it's, it's that kind oh, of thing, oh. right? Um, and, and there are maps there, and there's all kinds of work. So I also emailed Dr. Kelly and, and asked him some questions, and I read through all his work. So that really was helpful in that way. And then when I went to Ireland, I spent, I divided my time the first week I was alone in Dublin between the museum and a library downtown, and I was just rifling through everything that was Iron Age Ireland and taking notes. And there is a lot because, you know, these are Celtic Druids that were an oral tradition, so there isn't a lot written. There's some things written, and some, some writers have gone back and written books about sort of the social history of Druids and whatnot. So I read all of that stuff, and I had taken a lot of notes. And then I came home and left it for about a year or two to kind of stew and started writing another book. And then I was partway through writing the other book, and I was feeling lonely for Estrada because he wasn't in in that book, and one night I said, where are you? What are you doing now? Because I'd left him in a really horrible place at the end of book three and felt bad about that. And the next morning I woke up knowing exactly where he was and what he was doing and what he was into, and I said, okay, I'm writing the wrong book. So I stopped writing that one, and I just started writing To Kill a King. And because I'd had all of the research already, I think it was already filtering, filtering through my mind and my subconscious, and I was able to just pull it up in lots of different ways. I see you also worked uh, for a year as a relief uh, lighthouse keeper. Yes. Um, what was that like, and how did you work that into your fiction? Right, okay. Um, that's a great question. So th when you in Canada, when you're a relief lighthouse keeper, you actually work for the Coast Guard. And I was really stressed out. I was teaching high school. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, there's yeah. defense at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, teaching high school full time and really stressed out. And my friend was a, re was a lighthouse keeper. So I put in an application. I thought, why not? And so what you have to do to be a rel relief lighthouse keeper is you have to be physically fit. I'm not terribly physically fit. I will admit that. Okay. <laughs> but, but you have to be able to at least do some kind of landscaping chores. And because you look after the, the land around the, the lighthouse and the, the houses and things like that. And you have to have your first aid and you have to have a marine radio operator's license. So I did those things. I actually got hired and I took a year off school teaching and went out. So because I was relieved, they were, sending me by helicopter, basically, to all these remote locations with all my gear. And I would go out for so many weeks or days or weeks at a time. Usually it was weeks. And you have to take, you know, two or three weeks' worth of food with you. And because I'm gluten-free, dairy-free, that was a whole issue, too, because <laughs> I have special food. But anyway, I had this huge amount of, of gear, and I would, I would drive over to the island and pick up a helicopter or... However, I would get there, and I'd be shipped to the, the lighthouse. And you basically learn on the spot from the other keeper. There's always two keepers, two houses, two keepers at a lighthouse. So you each take 12-hour shifts. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, and, it, and it's fantastic. So the last place that I worked was Nootka, and it is on the far west shore, kind of north of Tofino, if you know the island. Mm -hmm. um, Vancouver Island on the very west coast. So that's where they have the big waves and, you know, fear of tsunami and all that stuff. And uh, that one is where I'm setting a book that I'm still writing, which is Ghost Light. <laughs> that's the one I stopped to write to kill a king. <laughs> and so I'm halfway through that. And so I'm actually setting it right there. It's a very historical location where Captain Cook came and they signed treaties up there, and um, it's an amazing, amazing place. But I also worked on the other side of the island, which is the Inside Passage. And when, in, in the third book, in To Render a Raven, because of something that 
Michael Stryker does, the vampire gets mad at Michael and he steals Estrada's baby at the beginning of the third book. And so the whole third book is trying to get my, uh, Estrada's baby back. And to do that, they take a yacht and they travel all the way up the inside passage to the vampire's lair. So I got to use all my flora and fauna <laughs> and, my, and my lighthouse experience. Like, for example, seeing, you know, hundreds of Pacific white-sided dolphins come charging down the strait. I actually have experienced that, and that was really oh. cool. And um, orcas, of course, and, and, uh, and all those kinds of things. So, so that's how hmm. I got my lighthouse experience in. Are you prepared? Legacy Food Storage. The best way to protect your family is by being prepared. Go now to LegacyFoodStorage.com. Use coupon code HOM15 now for 15% off. Quick, go. You're listening to the House of Mystery radio show. History, crime. Conspiracy and paranormal mystery. When someone picks up your book and reads it, one of them, mm-hmm. what is it you want them to take away from that book? Like, what is it you hope that they get out of the book, other than the story itself? Happiness, I think. I, um, I really write to escape and de-stress. I started writing when I was a high school teacher, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was writing all on the weekends and all during my holidays to feed myself. I mean that on an energetic level, not because I was making a lot of money at it. Um, (laughs) And (laughs) so when when somebody reads it, I'm really hoping that they get to escape, that they have fun with it because I have a lot of fun when I'm writing. And I think that's the main thing. I'm not trying to teach anything. I just... I just really want to enjoy the journey. Yeah. So what are your, what are your biggest influences? Like how do, what, what charges you up? Is there other, other books, other types of books? What do you read? Do you like movies? Mm -hmm. Um, Like kind of what, where do you go? Sure. Um, Action adventures, a big one for me. And actually my books are all action adventure. I think all of this stuff is in there. So the so the action adventure is great, and um, you know I like thrillers, I like mysteries, I like British mysteries. They seem to be a little bit more edgy than anybody else for some reason. And I'm also in terms of of mentors, I would think Joseph Campbell is a big mentor for me, The Hero's Journey, and I've read all of his his work. And Chris Vogler turned that into the writer's journey. So I use the hero's journey when I'm plotting as well. But not, I shouldn't say when I'm plotting. I write the draft and then I take the hero's journey and I (laughs) then can plot what I've done. And oddly enough, it usually works. Mm -hmm. How long does it take you to put together one of those books? Well, that depends what else is going on in my life. So in the beginning, when I was teaching uh, full-time, it took, you know, quite a while. 
Now I'm probably able to do a book in less than a year. So, so when you look back at, let's say, the first book in this series, um, do you ever go back and, and think about ever changing anything or, or look at it um, where you'd like to see something different? You know, to charm a killer, I really still like to charm a killer the way it is. I've changed the cover three times, hmm. I think. Three, four, maybe four. Um, but um, because the, the, the last editions we have are the tattoo editions, so all, the, so all of the book covers are tattoos that characters wear in the novels. But, hmm. um, no, I, I, it's interesting because I often go back to it, and at the end of back, book four, there's, a, there's, there's a, a moment where Estrada wants to go back to the beginning. I don't want to say any more than that because it's, it's right at the end of the book. But he wants to go back to that time and to charm a killer when he feels he was different and things were different. And he wants to start again. Well, so, so what's next? Where, where are we heading now? Like, what, what, what do you plan next to do? Well, I just, I just finished drafting a small town romance with a lot of suspense and adventure. And that just came back from the developmental editor. So I'm in revision with that one. And then I am halfway through Ghost Light, which is the lighthouse mystery. And I'm not sure where that's going to go. And then at the end of book four for To Kill a King, there just happens to be a little cliffhanger. <laughs> So, uh -oh. <laughs> so uh -oh. I think, um, yeah, I think that there will probably be a book five in this series. I, you know, I won't be able to stop because I'm just too connected. Right, right. You're very, very involved in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what do you suggest if, if there's a, a, a new writer or a person that hasn't been published yet but writes a lot, um, what would be your advice? Okay, I think the, the really, the really important thing is to to get those words on the page. However, you do that, and um, so if you're saying they're writing a lot, that means hopefully they are getting the words on the page, and then to get the pages to to other people who are not your family and friends, because a that's not fair, and I've certainly inflicted my writing on my family and friends <laughs> enough a lot over the years in fact just my daughter just said to me that to kill a king is the first book that she said to me mom don't tell me anything <laughs> she said i want to read the whole thing when it's done and right now she's reading it and she's she was here yesterday for easter and she says Oh, I'm really into it. It's so cool. And she was telling me all the parts and where she's at. And she says, I think it's different because I didn't know anything that was going to happen this time. So, so don't tell your family and friends. I know, I know you, you're, you're excited and you want to because it's so hard when you're writing not to share what you're doing when you're excited about it. But don't. So try and find a group. And there are some really great, uh, great writers groups. I'm actually going to plug. Um, Creative Academy, the Creative Academy, because they're a fantastic group of, of people, and you can get, you can talk to people about your writing who are writers, send it to beta readers, so people who will read it, who know your genre, and will give you honest feedback, and then when you get the honest feedback, try not to get defensive, because it's really important to hear what people say. And I have a step back from it, and it's hard. I mean, I taught English for a long time, and even with students, you know, whatever feedback, they're like, yeah, but I did that because of this. And I'm like, okay, but it doesn't work. <laughs> so hmm. you know what I mean? Like you have, yeah. to, you have to be open to taking that feedback. If you can yeah. afford it, get, yeah. it, get an editor. Editors are huge. Yeah, it makes a big difference. It's, um, they're trying to make your book better. They're trying to make it a better, um, better writing, so to speak. Mm -hmm. 
you know, but but if one of the beta readers doesn't like what you're doing, you just you just go out and kill them. <laughs> well, you know, a little a little beta reader story for you is that in in book two, when Michael Stryker makes this big mistake with the vampire, my beta reader wrote very, and and I thank her for it. She, she was very emphatic. She said, "Well, that was a stupid thing. Why would he say that?" And and I'm like, "Oh yeah." And so I actually turned his stupid mistake into a whole other book. So, so that's because I, I, at that moment I could go, okay, stupid mistake. So do I take it out, or do I make it into something else? So at the end of the day, you're in charge, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And what's, yeah. what do you think the the key or the most important thing is to to a book when you're putting out? Is it the story itself, or is it the grammar? Or is it what 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 do you think of the key? To, to a book is? Oh, I think it's the story itself. The grammar can always be fixed and stuff like that. Although, please do fix your grammar because yeah. there's nothing that turns people <laughs> off than typos mm. and grammar mistakes. And, and indie authors get slammed for that constantly. And it, and it brings a kind of, you know, it's one of those clouds over indie authors that, oh, I picked up this book and it had a lot of mistakes. So, do that, but that's part of a, a different process. The thing is to make it, make it, I think, as, as, as exciting and as passionate as you can and, and, and emotional hooks. You, you really want to have the emotion shine through so that people can connect to those characters and you can tell the real story that's going on there. So did you like the publishing world now, the way it is, like with Amazon and, and, and a lot of the indie writers and stuff that, don't check their grammar. <laughs> Do I like it? I mean, yeah, I, like no. I mean, um, compared to compared to ten years ago, like it's a huge change, right? Like things have is. really changed in the publishing world. When when you're doing books back in the '90s or even 2000, it, it was a lot different process than it is today. And there's so much more out there. That's. A, do you think it's getting better, or what's your opinion? You know, I'm I'm of two minds there. I think it's really positive in a lot of ways because now people do have the opportunities to get their books out there, um, whereas before it was kind of, if you didn't have a traditional publisher, you couldn't go anywhere. So as now, for an indie author, there are a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities out there, and I really appreciate that. And there are some great ways to do it besides Amazon. So, um, yeah. I mean, I think that's good. I suppose the, ne the, the, the sort of more negative thing is that there are so many books out there <laughs> that finding yeah. your books is kind of like winning a lottery sometimes. Yeah, it's almost too much sometimes. Um, yeah. It, but so I see the think? same thing. Sorry, I see the same thing when I walk into like an actual physical big bookstore. You know, there are, if, if you walk in there with the wrong idea and you see all of these books on the shelves, you can get really depressed and go, why would I even bother? So don't do that because you really need to get your story out there and try not to get sucked into that because it's, I think you have to keep remembering that you have something really important to say as an indie author or, or as any author and to keep, and to keep, keep working at it. Yeah, and I think that's important. Uh, same as to stay away from looking at reviews or looking at what people say online and stuff. Because it takes your focus off of what you're doing, your writing, right? Well, yeah, the marketing is a huge aspect to it. That I'm just really glad I have a publicist now because I'm I'm such an introvert that I love to go and talk about my books, but calling people up and asking, can I come and talk about my books? That, that is something that I'm not good at. <laughs> so if somebody well, says, it, here, go there and do this, I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. It, it does need to be kept separate. It's really tough. Do you, do you, do you look at your reviews? Or are, you, are, are you upset mm -hmm. if you get a bad review? Like, does it, Do you follow that or do you stay away from that? Fingers crossed. <laughs> haven't got a bad review yet. Well, we'll take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, 
Well, well they, you know, but it's going to happen. It's just like with social media and the way it's all over, there's going to be somebody that doesn't like something. It might be the way you, mm -hmm. you have your hair in a picture. It might be the way you mm – -hmm. it, it can be the littlest thing. And it, it, it's not necessarily about the product – or how you write, you know, um, because it's pretty, it's a pretty open world now, you know, with all the social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Reddit, all this stuff like this, you know, people can just say anything now. That's true. That's true. Well, let's keep my fingers crossed then on that one. <laughs> yeah. Just well, you know, you know, let's yeah, let's let's hope that it's five star and all the way. Mm -hmm. um, do you, do you think the writing nowadays is better than it was? Um, 20, 30 years ago? Like when you talk about, like a lot of your um, writing and and the fantasy part of it and time travel and all these things, there's, there's do, do you look to older authors or older stories that have been around for a long time um, more so than newer ones? I think both. I mean, I, th I think there are some really great writers out there. And... I also, I'm also a book reviewer, so I write um, reviews on the Ottawa Review of Books, and, and I get a lot of, I got a lot of Canadian, they're, it's for Canadian authors, so I get a lot of Canadian authors sent to me, and, and I've sometimes heard people say there are no, there are, there are no great Canadian authors, um, I've actually heard that, yeah, but there, mm. it's not true, because I'm reading some, I'm reading some really good writing, yeah, so I yeah. think... I mean, I, I like to read classics for sure, and you know, I was an English lit teacher for years, so you know, I'm up on the the kind of old school books. But I also think there are some really great new books out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, how do people um, get a hold of you, or where do they find all your work, or what you do, or send you letters, or send you good reviews? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I'm on all the major retailers, uh, but I think another way would be my website, which is bluehavenpress.com. Fantastic. Now, we'll put that up on our website, of course, so people can do it, find you with one click. Um, do you, it, it, how did COVID, did it affect you in your writing the last year or so? Have you been, have you noticed a change? Honestly... I'm such an introvert that this was a really relaxed year for me because I didn't have to go out anywhere. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know it was, I know it was hard for a lot of people, and a lot of people went through a lot of pain, and I appreciate that. But as, like, for me, if I'm getting ready to go to a conference or something. I have so much stress around that because I have to go out. And it's like Jerry Seinfeld always says, you know, we go out so that we can go back in. We can go home. And, and I, you know, I really like being home. So, um, so for me, it gave me a lot of relaxed time where I was like, oh, I have the whole weekend. I don't have to do anything but write. And um, so it was good. And I got a lot of work done. Yeah, no, there's some people that say that. Uh, mm -hmm. We interview a lot of authors, but um, there's also ones that say that it kind of gave them a block. You know, they sort of got in the way um, mm -hmm. of their writing. So, so, so I, I sort of always ask. Uh, and also, do you think that it did it, did it, it, so it didn't affect you, but it, so did it make you write darker per se, or do you think you had a, a darker way, or did you kind of go the other way and, write a little brighter I'm just thinking that <laughs> um, I'm not sure if, if COVID affected me it the, okay what I'm trying to say is that in To Kill a King one of the interesting things that's happening is that there is actually a kind of a pandemic <laughs> Oh. But I was, but I wrote that before our pandemic, and there's also climate change, and those things I wrote before COVID. So the last year I was actually writing this uh, small town romance, and um, and finishing up To Kill a King. But I don't know. I think that 
I was more affected by the fact that I moved out of the city into an eco-village on an organic farm in the country. And that kind of really made me relaxed. And so I, I softened a little bit. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's one of the most unusual answers I've had. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually a little bit more extreme either way, right? You know, some people get darker and, and uh, because not just COVID, just everything was going on, you know, in the last year or so with, with the Trump presidency caused a lot of turmoil and mm-hmm. Black mm-hmm. Lives Matter and just all of the things going on. It's, it's, it's been a lot of upset, you know. For sure. I don't, uh, I don't watch the news. Well, that's a good thing. It's healthier. <laughs> so, that, I mean, I spend a lot of time in my head, as you can probably tell. And, yeah. and so if I don't watch the news, that's good. The one thing I did miss was um, going to, I like to do live readings, and where there's, or, or talking to people where there's actually energy in the room, and, and I find that's a lot more effective than zoom and so if you're doing zoom readings i don't know it's just not the same thing than getting together so i missed that part and when i did my launch for to kill a king on march 21st just uh last week um i actually did it in the woods with real people so i had it at a fish hatchery which is a, a run by indigenous people and they have a beautiful gazebo there, and they have hand cart poles and everything. And so I was at this place, and people came wearing their masks, and we all kind of did the social distancing. But it made a big difference to me to actually do it somewhere live. And I missed yeah. that piece of it. Yeah, there's something about the interaction, live people, and being around them when you're doing that, right? That's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it creates, like you said, an energy. So, you know, mm-hmm. sure. do you ever get blocked? Like, do you ever have a writer's block then, or is it like when you write from your impressions and in your in your mind, like you say, do, do, does does writer block ever affect you? No, and I I think part of that is because of my process. And a couple of years ago, I was actually teaching a class, and I started writing a book called From Spirit to Page: Writing with Your Muses, and it's about kind of my techniques to use meditation to connect with your muses and then get those words on the page. And I think if you use those techniques, you will not have writer's block. Well, there you go. So That's, you- that's how I work with it. Also, I'm going to just put out a shout-out here that Peter Gabriel is one of my muses. And mm-hmm. I, um, in To Kill a King, I have a druid bard who has Peter Gabriel's voice. Because I just, he's such, he's such a brilliant writer and he writes myth and archetypes and just incredible things. And so I wanted this bard to have his voice, but then I had to figure out how to actually describe that. And, and that was just a really interesting part. So muses can come in all different, in all different shapes and sizes, right? Yeah. With your type of writing, do you have, this it, is interesting, I thought about this. Do you think you'll ever co-write a book with someone else? Maybe. I, it's, I feel like I am sometimes. <laughs> no, but I, I mean another, another living yeah, another human being. Like another person. Yeah, like that's, that's alive today. That's, you know, maybe li- living on, down the block or somewhere. But, you know, I, and I mean that because, it, because when you do so much of your uh, work in the mind, like it comes from your impressions and it comes from, that feeling in it, I just wonder if you could really, um, you know, co-mingle with someone else that's doing the same or writing in a different way. Like, I just wonder how that would work. I think so. I mean, it would have to be somebody who has sort of a similar process to me because, right. you know, I, uh, like writing with somebody who is very much uh, somebody who plots everything out and outlines everything and then sticks to it, I think I would find that really difficult because I'd be saying, well, wait a minute, they're going to do this now. And they'd say, no, they're not allowed to do that. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, that's kind so of what I, I mean. It would, be, it would be kind of 
a little iffy, right? You know, I mean, just because I've written with other people and I know the, mm-hmm. the process can be kind of, it's unusual. It's a learning process going through it. But I just wonder, because you, you do so much from your own impressions, right, that you'd have to share that with someone. And I wonder if they, you know what I'm saying? It would be kind of a, uh, that's interesting. If you ever do it, let me know. I'd be interested. It, you know, I'm just thinking it might make a really good book because that person might want to kill me, and that could become a murder mystery. <laughs> well, you see, then, you know, another person could write about that story. That would be just <laughs> incredible. We've got a whole new series going here. <laughs> or I could come back as a ghost. I mean, it, it could go in a lot of different ways. Yeah, a ghost, <laughs> a ghost at, a, at a golf club. At, 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 at Love Affair in Vancouver. Is Love Affair still there even? Um, Back in when I was a, a young kid, that was the only place that was kind of goth. Um, I lived in Vancouver back in the 80s. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to say that, but I'm getting old. Um, and Love Affair was the only place that was kind of that way. So I love that name, and I think it would have been really fun to be here in the 80s. It was. When, yeah, I bet it yeah. was. I loved yeah. it. I mean, it was very, I mean, of course, that was down in the West End, and it was very isolated because the, the east side was all, that was before Expo, so all that was just warehouses and dark mm. alleys and roads. There was no Yale Town or any of that stuff. That was just all warehouse, and it was a scary place to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but Love Affair, yeah, um, was the place. The, and everybody had long black hair, you know, and all that. It was just, um, you know... And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know the guy from the cult plate that went there he used to go there um the singer um oh that was a big deal he was a big deal back in the 80s but anyway that was a long time ago and uh a whole lifetime ago yeah this oh. club is called pegasus okay well. uh yeah and it's uh it's quite an it's quite an interesting it's quite an interesting place so that's really where true charmer killer starts is in Pegasus, that's where the first scene is. And they often go back and forth into the club, but a lot of the time they're out running around in the woods or well, traveling. Sure. <laughs> in the woods and in the club, that's what we did. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes. In Stanley wow. Park. Yeah, certainly, mm-hmm. you know, lots of things happen. And nothing good happens after midnight, right? Is that <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a great conversation, and I'm glad you were able to join us. Um, today we've been talking to Kill a King and a lot about writing, and we've had the uh, author of that book, um, W.L. Hawken. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, David. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll tell you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.